joined by Eigen Robot. He is a robot, a friend, uh, and he publishes at eigenrobot.substack.com, uh, and he runs a podcast called Robot Friends. Welcome, Eigen. Hey, thanks. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Um, yeah, a, a bit of one of those days because I'm I'm now doing the the podcast and doing my uh, my regular scheduled job and carrying my pregnancy to term and <laughs> there's all sorts of things happening and uh, you know this is the only time zone I can I can deal with with uh, with the U.S. So it's um, it's been a day. It's been quite the day. <laughs> Yeah, it's I've, I've actually found it very helpful that we scheduled this for what's nine o'clock local time here. I have I'm on paternity leave right now, and I've gotten into a very bad habit of staying up until about seven in the morning and then sleeping until two or three in the afternoon. So it's good to be broken of that. Yeah, I think that's uh that's that sounds like probably what you need to do as a, as a new dad. I don't know. <laughs> That's definitely one thing I wanted to talk to you about because I'm I'm approaching. I mean, I'm not going to be a new dad, but I'm going to be very involved in the life of this new with this new child, <laughs> and yeah. uh, maybe even more so. So, um, yeah, how's it been? How are you feeling? How's paternity leave? I well, I love it for sure. I you know I like my job and I enjoy my work. But I also don't identify with it in, in the sense that, you know, if, if I were endowed with an enormous pile of money, I don't think I would feel any need to, to go and work at a 95 to feel fulfilled or feel like I had a purpose in the world. And so, you know, I have this wonderful opportunity to just take a few months off and, you know, get to know my daughter and support my wife while she's, you know, she's the primary caregiver. And, and it's great. It's wonderful. It's fantastic. I, you know, I, I wake up, I make sure that she has everything she wants at any given point in time. And I, I make faces at my daughter and sing her songs. And that's just my life. And then, you know, I tweet and play video games in the, the interstitial periods. But um, it's, it's wonderful, you know, getting getting to see this person who is just coming into the world who hardly is a human being at all in a sense, but at the same time is very, very much a person and just getting to watch her sort of become more and more, you know, she's, I think about seven weeks old at this point and she started, you know, she's almost doubled in size and, you know, sort of her ability to just be a human has, has increased quite a lot. You know, they start out, she, she was very good at first. She came out of the womb and she was ready to feed and had a pretty gentle disposition. She doesn't scream much, but you know, since then you can just see her getting more comfortable moving her body around and tracking faces and, you know, eating more regularly, they start out with very small stomachs. And so they have to feed almost continuously, but you know, now she can, she can down a solid half cup or, or cup of, of milk and then just get milk drunk and pass out. And <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm going on and on. It's a delight. Yeah, it sounds like it. Like that's, <clears throat> and we're, we're so lucky, like uh, here as well. I, I can do my, my, my day job remotely and I know obviously I have all these projects and all this stuff, but I can do this from the comfort of my little hamlet in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, and my husband as well, He's he's got his own business. He, he works online as well. So this is the plan, you know, like we were talking with friends who are still, who are still in the West and they're like talking about visiting daycares and, you know, trying to figure out where to store their children. And I'm like, I this is not a problem I'm gonna have anytime soon. The, the children stay with me. They're gonna be stored in close proximity to whatever I'm doing. So. In the cupboard, yes. <laughs> exactly, I mean, you, you probably need some, uh, some uh, instructions on on where to store them, but yeah, we'll we'll figure it out. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure there's going to be great places to put them, um, but it's it's yeah, it's an exciting time. But I'm I'm at that point in my pregnancy where I you know I was I was bragging up to this point like this is this is nothing you know all these women who are they're bitching about uh, you know suffering through you know terrible pregnancies that's nothing but now you know going up a flight of stairs is a bit of a problem uh, you know a bit of water retention <laughs> you yeah know, I'm walking like I I do these walks every morning with my husband uh, and now oh, good. he's 
he's yeah he's like a bit of a cocker spaniel now because he's like you know normal energy man <laughs> and i'm <Yeah. laughs> this, this weird woman and i'm huffing and puffing just walking at normal pace and he's like are you okay you look like you're having a stroke well you know that's just that's just how i am now <laughs> yep <laughs> But yeah, it should, you know, this is, this is a cycle of nature and it's pretty cool to, to go through it. And yeah, we're blessed in so many ways and it sounds like you guys are too. So, um, yeah, I think, I don't know if I read this correctly. I read this a long time ago, one of your tweets or someone posted it, but is there kind of a Twitter connection and how you met your wife? Maybe? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, partly I was, I was her second follower and I feel pretty good about that. Oh, nice. Who was um, that first bastard? <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, um, the I, I think the what so um, she was roommates with one of my friends, orthonormalist, and I met her through him. Um, I I was going through a fairly unpleasant breakup, and I was moving, and ortho ortho lives out where I am, and he suggested that she if she wanted to kill some time she could come over and help me move which was very convenient for me since well you know i got help moving and uh i i guess she just she just likes to help people move which i understand and, and i appreciate both you know physically and, and philosophically so that's how i met her basically i i had known her online for a while before that but i, I didn't really know anything about her until she showed up at the storage facility where i put all my stuff yeah that's that's uh interestingly it's it's not online dating but it's it's quite like a, a little meet cute with an online component I, I like it it's uh it's it's very uh, contemporary <laughs> the, the way you met and the fact that she likes to help people move i think that is that's that's probably genius you know it's it's a workout uh i love to do that stuff i, I love, love to move stuff yeah i i love helping people move and also it would never occur to me to ask someone to help me move it feels like such an imposition and you know i'm from the midwest and the idea of imposing on somebody else is just just abhorrent to me but yeah no it, it's pretty uniformly fun to help people move and i mean for me and um there, there's an aspect i was chatting with someone on my podcast michael michael of barbary and you know, we, we were talking about what even comprises a community. And one thing that he mentioned was, well, you know, he lives in a small town in North Dakota and he knows all of his neighbors and he didn't feel like he was more part of a community until there was some natural disaster that hit and 12 people just showed up with trucks and helped him. I can't remember if it was move his stuff out or, you know, sandbag his house or something like that. But, you know, to an extent, if you can get 12 people to show up and help you move that, that feels real and that feels like some kind of a society in in the best possible sense yeah exactly i feel like you know this this is what they took from us yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, um you know because i've you know i'm and i'm now trying to kind of reintegrate into the semblance of a community after a year of covid and you know because i've i've uh, i used to live in london up until maybe a year ago uh, and mm -hmm. then i moved back to my my small town where i'm from um and i'm neighbors with my mom and you know trying to do the extended family thing um yeah and uh yeah, I mean, I used to live in, in the, the big metropolis here in, in Europe, in London, um, and the, the the complete anonymity and the distance that you had with neighbors and um, even it was just so like everyone was trying to make community work somehow, but no one was really trying to make community work. They were just like, yeah. oh, I wish I had community, but I really don't want to go through any of the friction that it takes to, yep. <laughs> to actually build it. So everyone was just like, I don't know, holding their farts in when they were meeting neighbors and like, uh, oh, it's, it's I want so community, weird. but I hate the HOA. What's the, HOA? <laughs> oh, uh, HOA, uh, Homeowners Association. Um, or like the um, whatever whatever they have in condominium complexes that that sort of facilitate the operation of condos. I mean, just I, I hate those things for sure. So it's yeah, it, it feels very difficult to make that work in cities, and I, I don't really know what the solution to that is. I mean, we were, we were talking, and this is not necessarily a segue, but maybe it's a segue. Uh, we were talking a, a beforehand about you know, the, the future of liberal democracies and, and so on. And 
I wonder if there's an extent to which cities are just a solvent for communities and, and individuals. You know, you show up in a city and it's just very hard to maintain these sort of informal networks and informal ties that maybe feel a bit more real in the country or say in the wilds of North Dakota where you might be hit by a blizzard and need help if you're going to make it through the, the winter. And it, it seems like it's maybe difficult to have a liberal democracy or a, maybe maybe a republic in some sense if you don't have people who are actively participating in society is something more than individuals or people who show up and vote but but you know without any intermediate steps yeah yeah i i agree with that i think it's it's also just simply not needing each other anymore now you know yeah anything that you might need the market steps in to to help you and even if you fall through the cracks well then there's some form of social service you know this the state steps in as the, as the guarantor of, of last resort but um you know a hundred years ago you wouldn't have bought insurance because you know you had a family that would help you if you were in dire straits or uh you wouldn't have I don't know, you wouldn't have participated in a lot of, you know, buying all sorts of gadgets and stuff because you'd have someone to, to help you with that as well. You you know, someone to fix your existing products. And uh, there's so many ways in which um, people came together because they really needed each other. Like there's, there was no opting out. You couldn't really have a beef with your baker uh, because yeah. you didn't like him because that was where the bread came from. So you, you had to. Um, not only stay on good terms, but also develop the skills that it takes to to negotiate relationships with difficult people. Um, yeah, yeah, because like you, that's the problem with the homeowners association. It's it's uh, it's populated with assholes. <laughs> yeah. People are assholes, but <laughs> no one wants to deal with assholes anymore. We we've lost the skills. We're just like, oh no, I'm opting out of this. You know, I'm I'm consciously uncoupling from the homeowners association. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, actually, okay, so I'm, a couple of things. I mean, one is that my understanding, and I mean, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on how people lived 100, 150 years ago, but my understanding in the United States is that there were actually, the, that the country was just thick with these social organizations that operated sort of as insurance groups. You know, if you were part of a well, not a guild exactly, but you know, Freemasons and and you know, various various societies partly operated as insurance. And the idea would be that, you know, you would show up in, in this association, you'd stick around with it for a long time, and if somebody in the association was having a hard time, everybody else would come and chip in, and maybe there would be a collection, and maybe it would be actually be some kind of a formal insurance, but you know that the idea was people would look after each other and sometimes it was a church and, and sometimes you know it was a, a fraternal organization or a sororal is that the word organization but but they existed and i i think there was a kind of a crowding out where once you know once government took over a lot of social insurance functions you know that was sort of a major reason that these these different societies existed and so once that was taken over by government then well you know it, it gets a lot harder to have these societies i think there was probably there were probably other reasons for their decline i mean you know with greater geographical mobility it's it's sort of hard to keep multiple generations in these things and even just keep members in place so yeah. it's it feels complicated um, yeah for sure i think my my set of examples <laughs> just borrows from eastern europe rather than from from the yeah. the, the more uh, enlightened west where you guys have all sorts of associations and clubs or used to have you know pre pre yeah. uh that um you know we don't don't really that much like that you know vo being voluntary labor in eastern europe just means something that the communists impose on you <laughs> voluntary was just just meant the opposite like many things under communism um yeah people don't really do that stuff it's just you know it's the high trust low trust society you know dynamic and we haven't we maybe are like slowly careening towards a higher trust society mostly by association with the european union and standard that that they kind of have to impose for us to be working with them but people are very mistrustful like you know it's very hard to set up a bowling league you know when everyone's like hmm i don't know <laughs> i don't trust you guys you know are you related to me if not you know you have to leave the bowling league so, yeah 
yeah, it's um but I think I think you're right in terms of in terms of what you know what was going on in in, in the West essentially because these are typically kind of Anglo-Saxon institutions that were yeah imported in ways and I guess you know you have that in Belgium and Germany there's similar things happening but it's very very Western the idea that you know you can scale uh, trust beyond your next of kin and you know not not get bitten in the first iteration of that <laughs> yeah yeah but but maybe less and less over time i mean it does seem like there's there's been sort of a decline in at least the the level of trust that people are willing to you know reveal to people asking surveys so yeah. what do you think i mean there's just all sorts of you know sp spice explanations for this obviously the fact that you know the homogeneity is, is dropping you know if you if you had you know if you had um kind of a homogeneous society uh it, you would have essentially had almost a, a kin relationship to people around you and you know people who look like you it's, it's easier to trust them even instinctively but you know this is one one area that people point to that you know might have eroded trust in the west but um what do you think could be tied into this like why why is is you know trust going now because that's what i've noticed as well in london and that was also part of why why i moved back to romania yeah, it's it's really a chicken and egg problem. I mean, are there are there fewer societies because you know trust is dropping? Are there multiple other factors? And I don't I don't exactly have a clear idea about this. You know, I, I grew up in Minnesota, which back in the day, in Minnesota and North Dakota, which I think were pretty high trust, especially the the town I grew up in was Grand Forks, which was maybe fifty thousand people. Um, you know small agricultural town primarily although there's a university there and regularly hit by natural disasters which i think were actually very good for community actually uh, that, that's a good point my, my town was destroyed by a flood in 1997 and i mean really destroyed um everybody everybody left the town there was a mandatory evacuation order um tens i would guess probably tens of thousands of houses were destroyed in a in a town of fifty thousand, and it was completely completely gutted president clinton flew in on a on a helicopter to uh survey the site and declare aid and um you know it was so it was pretty homogeneous for sure and th there was an air base to the north so there were i mean there was a little bit of ethnic variation that just came into the air base but even that was pretty rare in the town itself i mean it was a bunch of germans but primarily scandinavians and Scandinavian immigrants have a reputation for being, you know, pretty community oriented. And I think they carry that out, out to the high prairie. So, I mean, I can, I can definitely see an argument for homogeneity just based on my experiences. I can, I can see an argument for having to endure things as a community, as engendering high trust. There's a, a book by Sebastian Junger called Tribe. And as a, as a matter of social science, I, some parts of it made me wince, but his main point at least resonated, which is that, you know, there are some features of skilled society and, and maybe um, just society generally where once it gets comfortable and once it gets rich and there's less shared hardship, you, you start to see things resonating as a community less. And even the, the reimposition of some kind of a, you know, shared misery can actually be very good for a community and, and for engendering community. And, you know, when, when humans are suddenly in a situation where they have to solve a problem as a group, they, they tend to become massively pro-social. And, you know, then when you take away that, perhaps that external threat or, or that challenge, well, then they kind of drift off into atomization again. And, you know, I've, I came out of social science and I, I've become pretty skeptical of any kind of claim made by anybody in social science anywhere, but I mean, it's, it's a good story and, and I can see it for sure, but yeah. it's, I mean, it, it just, it just seems like a really hard problem. You know, Europe, Europe may be this, this den of you sociality, you know, saw the printing press introduced and then, you know, a hundred years of religious war. So, you know, what happens when you introduce the internet, that, that feels like it's going to just inevitably cause a lot of changes to, you know, to, to society and 
in the same way that the printing press did or if you know you want to go more directly to to the uk if you look at the enclosure movement i have no idea what that did to society and what country life in in scotland and the and the uk generally was like before before the enclosure movement but i i'm going to guess that was massively disruptive and it probably just destroyed lots of existing social institutions and you know forced people off the land that their ancestors have been tilling for hundreds of years so there are there are definitely a lot of available historical metaphors of maybe cases of just these long-standing societies being maybe brutally disrupted by technical technological or or economic trends yeah yeah absolutely i I think you know something that you you mentioned i think is is probably a big factor at least it feels to me like it's a big factor is the, the the concept of misery in general um even even apart from you know what it forces you to do with other people it's kind of the 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 dearth of of uh, of pain that we were seeing um because in a way now we're we're kind of slowly moving towards a phase of society where misery is almost completely opt in um you know star starvation is quite rare in the west um you know you you don't really have to be miserable except if you really mess up your life if you you know obviously get get addicted to some some heavy drugs or you know do you've got mental illness that you know blocks you out of possibilities for something else but for your average joe um you know they could essentially almost soma themselves completely lull themselves yeah. into into you know comfort with all sorts of stimuli that float into awareness from all sorts of directions be it food or you know entertainment or sexual stuff or whatever um and it seems like people who are kind of the the upper crust they're opting into different like selected forms of misery like i don't know spartan (laughs) race like i don't think it's like a it's a lower class thing i don't think anyone who's you know very working class is you know suddenly attracted to some some torturous i don't know ultra marathon or something it's this is kind of like a high class affectation or 10 day meditation retreats or all sorts of privations and starvations and fasting and stuff like that yeah um and it's weird it's kind of like we've inverted we've gone so far beyond maslow that we're now kind of you know forcing the gates to, to go back up to the to the lower levels you know with uh, with, with these opt in variants of pain yeah well i you know you mentioned that i wonder if there i wonder if there's some kind of conservation of suffering and maybe okay so maybe if people aren't suffering at all they go and seek out some kind of a hormetic dose of suffering you know some amount of suffering that's like actually beneficial in a way but I, but i also wonder if there's i mean i'm thinking about buddhism a bit here and i i don't know if i'm talking about suffering in the same way but there's I, I wonder if people who don't do that kind of, you know, seeking out at least a little bit of discomfort are more likely to be suffering in in some kind of a social sense. You know, I mean, you just thinking of people, you know, people who feel isolated, people who, you know, are not meeting people that they want to form some kind of a relationship, you know, the, the famed incel problem. Um, you know, I mean, I, I would say that people like that are definitely suffering and it's just it's just not the same kind of material suffering that you might might find historically you know very few mm-hmm. people are starving but maybe the the absence of thriving is just as painful or more painful in some way and i say this as somebody who's never starved so i you know maybe i'm blowing smoke but yeah yeah i like i like that you know the the conservation of suffering there's there's something kind of religious and metaphorical about it like you know if you're not going to this is it's pretty pretty jordan petersonian you know <laughs> like if you're not going to uh choose to um you know be uncomfortable in in chosen ways life will make you uncomfortable in, in ways that you you won't be choosing and might be even more insidious and then hard to get out of yeah, I like it. I'll accept it. I think it's it's good. <laughs> it's, it's correct. <laughs> Caveat emptor. I have no idea what I'm talking about. 
Yeah, I mean, this is a podcast. No one's expecting <laughs> you to, to be proposing solutions. We're just we're just uh, vibing here. Uh, um, another thing I want to ask you is about post rationalism. You are a, an associated figure of this uh, the post rationalist movement. I don't know if you identify as a post rationalist because I don't I don't think I know anyone who actually does identify like one. But you know, I think you know enough about it to ex explain it. What is post-rationalism and, and are you one? Yeah, okay, that's an interesting question. I I have this ongoing thread of about things about which I refuse to have an opinion. And one of them was the definition of post-rationalism, but I did follow that up by, by stating that I would continue to identify as a post-rationalist. So I feel comfortable with that. Um, a brief history of post-rationalism. In the late aughts, there was sort of a coalescing of a bunch of internet people around figures like Eliezer Yudkowsky, most prominently, Robin Hanson, and others, um, you know, the site Less Wrong. And their thing, especially Yudkowsky, was rationalism, sort of a... Um, I, I have an episode with somebody who actually did an intellectual history of it. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to sum that up. There's a, I think, Polish figure who was an antecedent. But, but basically it was sort of, a, you know, this idea that people could use rationality somehow to find, you know, a lot of math, a lot of utility optimization. It was sort of Benthamite in some ways um, to, to make the world a better place and do cool things. And out of that movement, it, it split into many different directions. You know, there are people who are worried about AI risk. There are people who are worried about worried about. That's an interesting way of putting it. There are people who are interested in um, things like effective altruism and so on. And, and there is a subgroup that became interested in more sort of woo topics, things like rituals, things like, um, you, you know, sort of more anthropology and sociology. And, and some of those people ended up forming something like this idea of post-rationalism, um, sort, of, sort of becoming interested in what was being left out of rationalism. And some major figures there were people like David Chapman, who writes at Meaningness. Um, Venkatesh Rao was somehow associated with it via Ribbon Farm. Sarah Perry, other people like that. And that never really cohered into some common set of methods, but I think, or, or you know, tenets about the world, although David Chapman comes closer. But, but more just a series of people who, I mean, frankly, ended up going to the same parties and, you know, reading the same stuff. So it's, I, I think, especially, especially around 2016, it became a group that started coping with the fact that everything was becoming rapidly politicized. And that's something that became especially interesting to me and and trying to come up with ways of just existing in a society where everything was becoming political and and badly you know it didn't feel to me like some sort of an interesting politics where there was something real at stake but rather people just absolutely losing their minds to you know whatever whatever systems were were vying for control of of mind share and i found that really unhealthy and i, I you know, personally in my own life, um, you know, it was, it was very destructive to a lot of relationships that I had, both, you know, romantic and just social. And suddenly it became very difficult to exist in a relaxed way without dragging this, this larger culture war into, you know, every part of existence. So, I mean, a lot of what I've been doing is trying to find, I don't know if hacks is the right term, but, but just ways around that and also trying to build my own space where I can exist with other people who want to do something else, anything else, just talk about anything that's not these, you know, these um, sort of invasive, invasive mental models that seem to dominate everything else around. Mm -hmm. So would you say that that's, that's kind of the, the, the ethos of, of most post-rationalists just kind of opting out of both the, the Benthamite utilitarianism, you know, writ large, and then also out of the, the continuous churning of, I mean, I, I used to be in kind of the effective altruism circles as well. And 
they they became extremely woke, extremely fast, and there's there was a lot of takeover, and you know it, it tilted the culture really fast in almost every group. You know, <laughs> there's always like effective altruism too. Uh, you know, heterodox effective altruism. All these yeah. groups were respawning to to cope with the fact that <laughs> you know that there were, there's a bigger religion than your utilitarianism, guys, and it's coming for every group. So yeah, I, it got pretty old pretty fast. Yeah. I mean, I think um, there's there's this element of it where I, I, I mean, you know, this, this is something that I'm especially interested in, but, you know, there, there are other other I, I think there's not necessarily any unified direction that post rationalists tend to go in. I mean, it is ultimately just a bunch of people who spend time in the same social spaces and talk about a lot of the same things, but, you know, interests vary quite a lot. And and I don't think any of us necessarily, well, say reject the Benthamitism. Some people do for sure. I mean, there there are parts of the the old rationalism core that I disagree with. Like it, you know, I I'm much more interested in heuristics and much more. I, you know, I'm a data scientist in real life, and I spend my my time, you know, trying to be very. I, I mean, sort of rational about the way that I approach things, but also you know there are limits to it, and and I I've through work and, and through study. I mean, I've just become skeptical of a lot of the tools that I use on a daily basis, or at least aware of their shortcomings and limitations. And, you know, there's this, um, I mean, David Chapman, I think has influenced me, especially in, in this case, this idea of being willing to swap between systems as it becomes useful, right? You learn some, some way of understanding the world in kind of a comprehensive way, but you know, any any model that you have for the entire world is is going to be limited in some ways, and it's not going to be appropriate to every problem. So, you know, you don't model say the way that organisms operate simply by by using a physical model of the universe. Of course, every, maybe every phenomenon that's happening is going to be physical on some level, but it might not be the interesting one if you're trying to understand, you know, why a human is talking to another human. It's not just this interplay of particles. There are these emergent properties, and maybe you should switch to a different lens to understand it. So I, I think, you know, if there were maybe one unifying thing in post-rationalism, it's it's this emphasis on being able to switch frames to whatever seems most appropriate to to any given context. And, you know, on Twitter, a lot of the times the context is what's going to be the most interesting or the most fun at any given point in time. So Yeah. Yeah, that that makes sense. I think that's a a nice. Um, uh, I don't know. I, I probably identify with that version of post rationalism as well, um, because yeah, I mean, you you be if you've been around long enough in these circles and you've kind of, you know, went went through a few of the of the internet cycles. Um, you you kind of realize that you know no no frame is uh, is is enough, and that's why you know. I I kind of slowly drift away from from labels as well because I, I've also kind of been burnt a little bit because I'm still a bit of a Twitter noob and then whenever you talk about something like I don't know rationalism or paleocon or trad or something you essentially bring into the discussion you know this whole behemoth of a, of conceptions that people have the, that are very varied about the concept that you're using so i think it's it's probably best to to i don't know stay maybe one step away from from inserting these labels into conversations cuz yeah i mean i think the most of the criticism that i've gotten on twitter was about what people think that I represent in in terms of one of these labels, and then you know <laughs> that I'm I don't know close to close to Nazis or you know all sorts of you know weird associations and and you know conceptual associations that people have about stuff. So yeah, I don't know. It's um it's something that I'm still navigating. But yeah, I, I like the I like the the definition that you you propose. Yeah. Well, it's it's. People are mad at you, really? Uh, yeah, I mean, people, people are mad at everyone on Twitter. It's just like, <laughs> I guess I don't, that's I don't, true. I don't see it when people are mad at you, but <laughs> like I'm sure oh, they are. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh no, people get mad at me. I mean, I, I, I like yesterday the the Derek Chauvin verdict came down, and I was sort of, um, well, how to put it, like flamboyantly 
not caring about it. I mean, I mean because I, I sort of resented it. You know, the the I I care a lot about Minneapolis. I grew up there in 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 for for a large part of my life, and I care a lot about you know a, any number of things related to the trial. But like everybody caring about the same thing at the same time in the same way feels sort of um, it felt kitschy to me. Have you have you read uh, Kundera? I don't know if that's actually popular in. Uh, yeah. But you know, you know, he he talks a lot about Soviet kitsch and the unbearable lightness of being, and you know, the sentiment, the the outpouring of sentiment yesterday. I mean, I, I think for a lot of people, it was genuine in some sense, but there there was it it felt very kitschy, and I mean, the entire situation still feels complicated and gross to me, and I don't think there's any, I don't know if there's anything really good to be, you know, derived from it, and I, a lot of a lot of my. I don't know, I don't want to say contempt, but uh, levity about the entire situation and, and like, you know, um, conspicuous refusal to care was just just sort of an effort to like make space for people who wanted to not be swept up in that. And and people were mad about that because of course people were mad about it. I mean, like any any time that you, you know, break with some, um, some, some mini zeitgeist, like people are going to be pissed yeah. and that's fine. Yeah, especially because your position was that you don't care. Like you, you have to care one way or the other. You know, you either have yeah. to be out outraged <laughs> because I don't know it took too long, or you have to be outraged because it's the wrong verdict. And obviously, he was he was innocent or whatever. Um, yeah, it's 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 a, it's a crazy thing. Like even even me in my little you know Romanian hamlet was thinking, hmm, what what should my position be on? This? Oh God! <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, right? And and it's yeah. I mean, I think it's it's very interesting to me that, you know, somebody is trying to care a lot about something and you just clearly are not willing to resonate with them emotionally on that thing. I mean, they people often take it very personally and, you know, I don't know. I, I just, I do not believe that a lot of people are going to remember this in like a year, you know? On the other hand, I guess people still get pissed about O.J. Simpson, so meh, who can say? Yeah, and also it's it's not really a, an event anymore. It's been it's been through the machine multiple times. It's it's very hyper real. This whole you know it's it's a, it's a pseudo event. It's something that you know was was captured on on camera, obviously, and yeah. the actual capturing of it on camera was the event. The fact that we have this nugget of information that can get, you know, ping ponged around the internet and reinterpreted and, and restyled through everyone's filter. And then, yeah, that that's that's the event. I mean, it's things like these. Oh, yeah. All the time. Yeah. It's not even the base level thing anymore. It's it's like what it's come to represent through. I mean, just just everything. I mean, you know, you know, you you probably saw some of the protests last summer and some of the events surrounding it. I mean, it was, it was directly religious, you know, like yeah. the, the cry and the, the wailing and like people begging for forgiveness from other people. And it's like, it was bad. It definitely, I mean, like I have a lot of complicated feelings about it and like what is even possible to, I, I mean, okay. I'm even, even this, I don't feel good talking about, but I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a, it's a mess. And and yet people are like projecting a lot of meaning onto it themselves, which is fine, but you know, don't expect me to get swept up in it. Yeah, it's um it's it's also really interesting how, you know, this this type of event captures the imagination of the world as well. Like the Yeah. What is up with that? I mean, you you know, you were talking about living in living in Eastern Europe and feeling like you had to have an opinion about it. I mean, I, I have to tell you, I do not feel obliged to have strong opinions about local events in eastern europe really at all yeah that's just you being provincial you know you should yeah <laughs> please <laughs> well but, if i knew what any were i might yeah i mean i don't think you'll, you'll find out to be honest I, I i know little about the local events here as well to, to buy to my shame um but yeah it's um it's it's really interesting like uh, american cultural empire is is still going very strong it's just because of the internet you know if you if you own the means of a means of intellectual production you're gonna be you're gonna be producing a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that's you know it's just more 
more interesting. And once you speak English, that's the key to the world. You know, once you speak English, yeah. you have access to all the memes and they have access to you. So that's why I, I keep bringing this up. My friend was talking last year about the, like abortion rights in Alabama. And she's this is like a normal, you know, chill girl here. And we were just having coffee and, you know, being being Romanian. And she's yeah. like, you know, have you heard about abortion rights in Alabama? I'm like, I have because I'm on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. How have you heard about this stuff? I thought I was just, you know, being weird. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's very strange. That man, I it feels to me like there is an element of real cultural imperial. I don't know. I mean, you you look at you look at the world as it existed, you know, maybe thirty or forty years ago, and it seems like there was quite a lot of American cultural imperialism, and even even you know even before the internet. I mean, Coca Cola was everywhere. I. I had a friend maybe 10 or 12 years ago who between grad school and his first, between his first job out of college and, and grad school, he fascinating guy. He blogs now at a fine theorem, which, which is just a hardcore econ blog. But th this guy, Kevin Bryan um, was he, this is back when it was very easy to rack up huge quantities of airplane miles by, by running credit cards. And he had a scam where he was working at a federal reserve bank. And what he did was he, he bought out, he took a, an airline credit card where you get free miles and every month he would open a new one. So he would get the bonus miles from opening the credit card. And then he would max out the credit card buying currency directly from the federal reserve at face value. So he would get a huge amount of points from that. He would take the currency that he bought, go and deposit it in his bank account, and then he would pay off his credit card. So by the end of this, he had, he had like millions of frequent flyer miles as bonuses from his credit cards. And he just took a year off to fly around the world for free. And uh, I think these loopholes have been closed, sadly. But he was telling me um, he went on a flight. He, he was maybe like walking around the mountains in Tibet or, or something absurd like that. And he was walking from one place to another and like a kid came out of the, you know, the, the village that he was walking up to, to let him know that Michael Jackson had died. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, come on, really? Yeah, well, so, I mean, like, I think, you know, like the, there was some kind of cultural export that was happening before, but maybe it didn't seem like the politics was being exported as much. And maybe, maybe that's changing now. Um, I, I think it was in a way and and to to the benefit of some people like for example we had Dallas like Dallas was the was the most imp probably maybe maybe the most important cultural artifact to, to lift Eastern Europe out of uh, um, out of communism um, because for some reason they thought it was you know subversive to just to let us see the the decadent West. Uh, and yeah. you know, uh, see like how um, I don't know degenerate the, the these Texans yeah. were, but what people uh -huh. just saw were like really nice clothes and appliances and nice cars and obviously I don't know intrigue and whatever. But the the context was pretty glitzy and you know people were like they're borderline starving by the end of uh, you know yeah. the eighties here. So Dallas was like it it like the, you can't even imagine it you know people say oh you know game of thrones was a big show no everything was would empty the streets would empty it was dallas time all the children would go go indoors you know it was like you know i am legend in the streets because everyone would be watching <laughs> dallas and even with reruns like any anything they just just, just love it because it was just such a unique thing and and then they were like, okay, we really need to get rid of this dictator, guys, because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is pretty oh, good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's it. I mean, like, yeah, that that was, I actually know a little bit about that. I mean, Romania, so that would have been, uh, I'm Cuscu, am I pronouncing that? Ce Ceausescu, that's a hard one. Ceaus 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 yeah, Ceaus right. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that um, went quickly. Yeah, that went really quickly. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, people were itching to do it, so you know, they they just they they had a chance, they took it, um, they 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 sorted out very swiftly. Um, I think the, the most shocking part of that whole thing was that you know the the confusion on his face, like the cult of personality was really deep. 
Um, he really didn't understand what was going on. He really thought that people, you know, loved him and, you know, adored him and him and his wife. And, you know, it was quite shocking. Like the, you know, those last bits of footage of him, just, you could just see he was dumbstruck. Like, what's going yeah. on? Yeah. Yeah, real, real preference cascade stuff. I mean, there's, yeah, there, there's, I, I, I think almost every day about, you know, preference cascades. Yeah, Timur Quran, private truths, public lies, and just, just the ability of a population to suppress their opinion for, you know, yeah. a Explain long that period a bit. Of... I don't think I'm, I'm familiar with that concept. Yeah, so the idea is that, I'm trying to think about how I can summarize this as quickly as possible. The, the, there's a Duke economist, I think he's a Duke, named Timur Quran, and he has a book called Private Truths, Public Lies. And it covers this idea of preference cascades. And the idea is that you may have, and, and I think, you know, especially for Eastern Europe, this may make a lot of intuitive sense. The idea is that suppose that everybody has their a true opinion about something. I'm not sure this is true, but let's accept it for the for, for the sake of conversation. You may not accept, you, you may not express that intrinsic belief that you have for any number of reasons. For example, maybe you'll be killed for it, or maybe you think it's likely that you'll be killed for it, or you may think that it will make you unpopular. But, you know, in any society, there may be some small number of people who are willing to express that belief anyway. And but if, you know, if nobody ever sees these people expressing that belief, then they may believe that nobody else in society has that belief themselves. But if you can shift people's beliefs about the distribution of beliefs in the society, very quickly, you can get this cascade where, you know, if you see that even 5% of the people in society also hate this thing that you hate, maybe you might go and speak up about this thing. And now suddenly 6% of people in society are expressing this. And that makes it seem safe to express it for another few percent. And very quickly you have, you know, in the society, a large number of people who have just been keeping their mouths shut because it feels very risky to express their belief about something. But then they see some number of other people speaking out and suddenly a large number of people who have had this belief, which has been keeping it secret, flood the streets and suddenly everybody can see that everybody else is also pissed about this. And it might get to the point where even people who really believed, you know, the opposite of what all of these people in the streets believed are keeping their mouths shut because they see everybody in the streets. They suddenly have this belief that everybody else in society thinks, you know, the opposite of them. And suddenly you switch from a society where everybody is keeping their mouth, you know, everybody has a belief and they're, they're not speaking about it to, you know, this complete inversion. And, you know, if you take a society like the United States, say, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, I think people would typically speak out pretty openly about whatever they were thinking at any point in time. And so you, you didn't necessarily see a lot of these preference cascades because everybody just knew what everybody else was thinking. But if, you know, if you were to look at Eastern Europe, maybe everybody knew that, you know, the, the system was terrible and, you know, people were mad about it. But until you had everybody in the streets at the same time you weren't going to get people speaking out because you know one person being mad at a time e easy to pick them off and and you know have them have them suppressed in whatever way was appropriate D does any of this make sense i'm not sure how i'm doing yeah it, it. yeah no no for sure absolutely i'm i'm reminded of this um the story i read in a book called uh, nothing to envy uh which was about kind of people who escaped uh, north korea um, and there was essentially a story about kind of how how someone got woke on on this whole preference thing, where I think it was the the death of uh, Kim Il, Kim Il Sang. I think that was the, the first the first the one. The first one, Kim's, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, all the students in the student town had to go out, you know, wail in the street and you know do that that thing. And you know, the the guy telling the story, I don't remember if it was a guy or a girl, but um, they were, they were, you know, crying, doing all the stuff. Obviously, you know, they're trying to cry more to, you know, kind of outdo each other. And then uh, they noticed that someone, uh, another student <clears throat> was like wetting their, um, their, um, I don't know, their clothes or something and trying to kind of apply the, the, the spit yeah. to their face. 
And then uh-huh. that was kind of like this red pill moment and this like, oh my God, everyone's faking it. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's that's the first domino in the cascade. Um, I, I'm curious what, what kind of the effect of um, kind of echo chambers adds to this, because in a way we live in very fragmented realities. Like for example, um, in, in my parallel reality, in my little echo chamber and in, in my groups, you know, being very open about stuff that you shouldn't be open about in, in real life is, is quite normative. Uh, it's almost yeah. even expected. Um, you know, we're, we're cascading hard within the group, but at the same time, I also know that it's kind of a separate space. You know, I'm, I do the podcast to kind of open up the, you know, kind of pry the, the Overton window open a little bit, but you know, it's, it's obviously, you know, you don't go whole hog instantly. And, uh, I'm, I'm curious what you think, like how, how does that, you know, is there an interplay between the internet and, and how this works? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I. You know, one thing that I'll say about the internet is that it, yeah, it really forced the the Overton window wide open, right? I mean, if you have some private belief, you're going to be able to find some area of the internet where you can express that and find other people who are also expressing it. I mean, it's a very different world than, than existed, say, in the 1950s, where there were like, you know, three TV stations, right? And everybody was getting this very middle of the road content, or at least somewhat coordinated you know, coordinated content being beamed into them and everybody was like, everybody was watching, well, not Dallas, but you know, whatever was being played on, on the TV station at 7 PM. And you you had very limited options in terms of like what you could choose. And, you know, people in a given area were pretty homogeneous anyway. And, um, relative to now perhaps. And like, um, you know, the content even was being made for the lowest common denominator for for society and so like it was very easy to coordinate around some central idea but you know the internet is and even before that things like cable made it easier for people to atomize and you know go and find their little echo chambers and um so you know i think that's partly true but there's it it feels it feels very complicated to me like there's Yes, there are echo chambers, but it also feels like, you know, if you're looking at news coverage, you pretty much get either something that's right oriented or something that's left oriented. The middle is almost hollowed out. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that that's probably just the the, kind of the incentive structure of of how media works now. Um, You can almost you can barely sell ad space without, you know, packaging it in, in rage bait or some some weird click you know, formulation. Um, yeah. You know, CNN does it to me and Fox News does it to them, but they're all, you know, they they, they, they phrase it in such a way to make you click to be like, oh, what's, <laughs> what's that? That on purpose to make you click. Yeah, I, you know, I have to, I have to imagine that, you know, they're employing data scientists and like hyper optimizing this stuff in, in the same way that everybody else is. I mean, it's, I mean, media companies are tech companies at this point, right? Like you're running a website, you're trying to maximize your subscribers and your clicks and your ad revenue. I mean, you know, it's, it's mechanical. I think that this whole model of journalism is being driven by, you know, the stories themselves feels pretty dead to me. This is speculative. I don't work at a newspaper, but I have in the past worked at a website that was sort of, sort of clickbait generating actually. I mean, hypothetically, I was an economist, but in practice, it was like, what can we write to drive people to this site with something approaching clickbait? And it was, honestly, it was soul killing. And, but, but I don't know, maybe, maybe media has just always operated that way, but it, it feels like the, the extent to which that's true is greater now than it used to be. Yeah, I think just the, the, the level of access that being, you know, permanently surrounded by the tools, these these kind of receiver, of uh, you know, um, emitter devices that we voluntarily surround ourselves with, uh, it just kind of changes the context completely uh, because you're you know you're in contact with this stuff all the time. So these companies have the opportunity not only to serve you all of these ads all the time, but also to to learn from from your interaction with them. So it's you know the the, the level of um, almost kind of like implicit understanding that these algorithms have about 
layers that you know the algorithm is is deaf dumb and blind it doesn't under, it doesn't have a theory about your mind, but it knows how you react, and it knows how you react so many times that it understands you at a level that you know no one understands you like your you know, like your Twitter feed in a way because it's just so refined. It knows you know little you know how to tingle your your lizard brain in ways that you know it's, it's almost mysterious how it does it. Um, but that's just you know that's just learning, learning from you you know and you you feeding it little bits of data, um, and I think that's you know people. People are pretty, they, they have pretty base drives, you know, if you really didn't <laughs> yeah. do it, you know, they, they're easy to, they're easy to tickle in, in, in weird ways. And we really like tribalism, we really know, we really want to know, are you with us or are you against us? We know you, it's really easy to, to whip people up into a frenzy, you know, and that's, you know, you, you can't look away from an, an enemy signaling something bad about your tribe. Um, yeah. It's just, it's well, it just, you know, fills you with these ancestral feelings. You need oh, to yeah. I hate it. I, I mean, you know, I, one, one way around this is to like be incoherent or, or be so esoteric that like people are saying bad <laughs> things about you, but what are they even saying? And, and of course, that's, that's not foolproof. Like, suppose that you're so inscrutable that you can't even be defined. Well, that just leaves some space for people to define you however they like, of course. So, yeah. I mean, but you know, when, when the New York times is going after Scott, I was, I was furious and part, part of that was personal. I mean, like Scott Alexander, really, he's the most like inoffensive guy and absolutely sweet. And, and I was angry about that, but I don't know. I mean, there's one other thing about, about preference cascades is that, you know, if, if you're able to implement an agenda by somewhat suppressing suppressing expression of alternative beliefs, like, you know, if somebody is able to go and express something or even discuss something in some kind of an open way, that could end up being a, a real threat to your, you know, your, your sort of intellectual hegemony, just because suddenly then other people are going to start talking, you know, about these alternative ideas and, you know, once you can even question something, the dam breaks pretty quickly if your ideas are not actually that popular. And so, you know, Scott goes and he writes articles and they, they end up very popular. And I think that's actually quite a threat to a lot of the dominant cultural, um, let's, I don't want to say dogmas, but something along those lines, you know, sort of even, even being able to open, even a, being able to critique something, even if you don't espouse a position is sort of dangerous. You know, there's this, um, there was a medieval theologian named Peter Abelard and he, I think was forced to burn his work sick at non. He may, maybe he wasn't forced to burn it, but he pissed a lot of people off at least. And sick at non would just take theological issues, you know, whatever people were arguing about and sick at non means yes and no. And for any given issue, he just wrote a, a pro and a con argument for for each, you know, uh, he would write an argument for each side of it. And the reason that he was condemned was that he didn't say which one was right in the end. He was just like, here are the best arguments for this, here are the best arguments against it, and then leave it at that and leave it up to the reader. And that was intolerable to the church who said, no, you have to like have resolution on this. You can't just leave it, leave it hanging. And I, th I think that means something like, not having to espouse something, but just describe it is sort of a threat in some ways to, you know, a, a hege hegemonizing egregore. Yeah. Yeah. I think in, in a way I kind of can understand the instinct to do it. Um, because if, if your goal is like in, in the case of the church and in a way, any sort of elite, um, they want continuity, they want stability, um, and, even leaving the possibility of a destabilizing idea out there is, you know, needs to be snuffed out. And that's kind of why I'm, you know, a little bit pissed off of the, by the nature of the discourse at the moment, because we're supposed to be in the marketplace of ideas. And that's, that's grating to me, because this is not a marketplace of ideas. And the, the, the pretense that it is, is, is quite, 
I don't know. It's, it's really annoying <laughs> because yeah. uh, it's it's clear that, you know, there's there's ideological capture. There's, you know, there's uh, guilt by association. There's people just being unpersoned because, you know, they're, they're not like important people or anything. But they the only thing they do is they, they mention destabilizing ideas. Um, and I think it's, you know, and it's, it's happening all across the, the discourse spectrum, you know, I'm a Nazi, you're a Nazi, um, and, you know, people, people even on the, and the, so the vaunted and anti-woke wing, you know, any, anyone an inch to their right is a Nazi or whatever their perceived right is a Nazi. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, um, I don't know. What's, what's your, what's your vibe about the marketplace of ideas, you know, oh, I mean, underrated. It, yeah. I mean, the wet marketplace of ideas, um. <laughs> I I think it exists to the extent that you're willing to go and look for it. And I wonder if that's always been true, actually. Um, it feels like maybe there used to be more, I don't know, I could just be making this up. I, I only have a vague, no, that's not true. So one of the most influential comic books that I've read in my life was Bloom County. I don't know if you're familiar, but it was a it was a, a political and social commentary comic in the 1980s by a guy named Burke Bre it's his his last name is written Breathed. And he he's just absolutely savage. He's you know doesn't act come from any particular political leaning. He 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 goes all over the board. But um it was this guy who came in and just, just wrote a political comic strip for 10 years and it was incisive and it was funny and I haven't seen anything like it since. And people could just go and like put, uh, this This is a nationally syndicated comic strip for 10 years and, you know, he was skewering everybody and, and just people were okay with this, you know, he wasn't chased out of parties. And... um. I don't know now. I mean, it. Everybody is, I think, just keeping their head down. I mean, I'm I'm tweeting anonymously, you know, pseudonymously, and I don't think that there's actually any risk to me. But uh, I, I, the fact that people can be like sought out and and have their careers destroyed for, you know, departing or even even not taking seriously the, the 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 cultural hegemony is, I mean, I, I think a little bit disconcerting and it it feels like maybe the marketplace of ideas maybe replaced with the black marketplace of ideas you know like people are still trading these things but you're not supposed to and it's yeah. risky exactly um it it probably i don't know this is kind of my my white pill in a way um it it feels like you know all of these um these battle lines are entrenching because the existing power structure is unstable and it feels its own instability, yeah. so it, it digs down into the categories that it's familiar with, and you know, the, the the looming specter of the Second World War is always there to to draw on. But you can only call people Nazis up to a certain point until you know the other people around are like, okay, you know, yeah, I mean, if everyone's a Nazi, no one's a Nazi. Let's listen to these people. See, let's let's see what they have to say. So. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I hope it's not working. I, I think it's working in part. Obviously, it's working temporarily. It's a band aid, but you know, there's a really big dam, and the internet's you know pumping pumping water into that dam every day. And yeah, it's it's gonna destabilize some things. But yeah, I'm. It's it's interesting. I mean, I think one thing that I probably should do but haven't is read a history of the the Great Awakenings in the United States. You know, it's it's. I'm not sure how, how common this knowledge is, but if you look at the United States, there are religious revivals every, you know, 30 or 50 or a hundred years, like really massive revival movements. And, you know, I think you can look at maybe especially the modern urban, urban left in the United States is kind of a, kind of an amalgam of um, amalgam, amalgam, an amalgam of like, Puritan and Quaker ethics or or maybe like Puritan methods and, and Quaker ethics or something like that. And, you know, one, one feature of America is that there are just these massive religious revival movements that crop up and eventually fade out. But 
how do they fade out or what does that process look like? I mean, if it happens over and over again and you model, say, you know, wokeism as, you know, one more instance of a, a great awakening, great awakening, like how does that process play out? Like how does it, where does it end if it ends? What, what causes it to fade? And I, I don't have answers to any of those questions, but I think it would be very interesting to read a history of this. Um, but, you know, the other, the other thing about this is that, you know, at this point, the this this successor ideology is really bureaucratically entrenched everywhere and so it's not just a matter of people just stop believing in it one day it's like what are you going to do with the the massive diversity equity and inclusion you know bodies that exist in every institution of of any significant size at this point i mean they're not going to want to fade out so you know, what do you do with that? And, and maybe the answer is something like just, you know, they become more bu boring bureaucracies that are complete, no longer have any real mission, but exist only to perpetuate themselves, which, you know, is bad, but maybe it's not that bad. It, I don't know, it feels in some ways a little bit hope hopeless to me. So yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's the truth. You know, once you once you build a superstructure, um, and you know, people use this argument a lot with the state, you know, once once you've built it, it never gets, it gets retracted. But I think that's probably the case with a lot of private uh, enterprises as well. And um, I recorded a podcast recently with with Aaron Siberium. Um, I don't know if you if you're familiar with him, but he had a really interesting argument about um, the growth of these, you know, diversity and inclusion um, programs, and um, it, he was he was saying that it was um, tied kind of to to the fact that um, only certain measures and outcomes are legible to the system. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's, uh, you know, e even inputs and outcomes, whatever, uh, the system only deals in legible things. Um, yep. So, you know, when you have, for example, you know, I, I actually studied diversity management, that's my major in, in, in college. No um, shit. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, look, look at me now. Um, so, <laughs> um, it was, um, you know, the idea, you know, ideas like the, the, the wage gap, you know, that's, that's, you know, simple mathematics, you know, if you look at it from that level of abstraction, yes, women make less than men. Obviously, if, if you, you know, bring your math hat, and then you look at confounding factors, and you know, other variables that might flow into it, women don't make less than men, at least not to a significant degree, and, and all this type of stuff. But, um, you know, on, on the one level, you know, you, the system only looks at legible things on the second level yeah. it only looks at things that feed into the system that make the system grow or at least maintain its its clout and power so yep. it's only going to look at you know first level paid like wage gap type stuff um and then yeah it's it's you know it, it kind of turns into the direction of power and only looks at the the legible stuff that it can see so it's it's i don't know it like you said it's it's it does look a little bit hopeless if you look at you know at, at what it can even do like what what are its functions what what can can a system do yeah and i mean you know traditionally the the other thing is that i think so okay so what causes you know bureaucracies to be removed i think in in industry historically what you do is like well okay if you have some giant bureaucracy in your firm that's dragging it down eventually there is competition in a firm and they have to either you know shed these these things that are dragging that are a drag on their productivity or you know they're out competed and they no longer exist as a firm and and other firms come along and you know take their place and operate in a more lean way but a lot of a lot of what's being driven right now is basically efficient for firms in the sense that it keeps them from getting sued and so it's just a matter of the regulatory environment continuing to exist in such a way that you know if you don't have these these large bureaucracies you're vulnerable to to large and expensive lawsuits and so it's also you know, a, a, a layer of protection um like many complicated bureaucratic measures you know this is stuff that big companies can comply with uh, and small companies can't comply with or it's it yep. becomes very expensive for them to comply with so it's, it's yeah. essentially yeah corporate protectionism where you know the the corporations make a deal with the state make this regulation as complicated and as burdensome as possible we can comply mm -hmm. with it and uh yeah that's that's how we protect from anyone trying to steal our turf it's yeah perfect private private um, you know government private partnership 
It's it's so un-American. I hate it. I I mean, you know, I was a I was an economist in a past life, and you know, I still the still one of the most derisive terms that I have in my arsenal is is rent seeker. I mean, I I just deeply resent all of the institutions and structures that do this sort of thing. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, like at this point, you know, if you have a if you have a moral justification for your rent seeking, I mean. Good luck breaking that on the popular mind, you know. So I, I, I don't, I just, I just don't know how it ends exactly. Um, I mean, I, I, I guess there's a large amount of deregulation, in in a more direct sense that was done by, by the Reagan administration, and somehow he he pulled that off. But I don't know that that almost seems sort of sui generis. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's a complicated issue, and you know, like if if you kind of take the the, the Peter Thiel uh, argument, in a way, there is there is no other function for a company except for trying to find a monopoly. In a way, trying to make sure mm. that they're in a position to to be rent seekers, or whatever. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. So yeah, I think in a way that's that's just where all, where all the incentives are pointing. Like you want to be able to, you know, yeah, to to be that guy, <laughs> which is sad. I mean, I'm, I come from Eastern Europe, so this this stuff seems seems natural to me. It's you know, you said it's anti-American. Well, it's very Eastern European. So yeah. it's, uh, I think this you know all, all uh, maybe that's why I'm so cynical and I can kind of put my lens on on the U.S. and say, yeah, this is where everything leads. You know, why are you guys surprised? <laughs> Do you, do you think that there's a do you think there's an analog to this that is political rent seeking like going and try, I mean I guess maybe that's just like yeah yeah it's a government but um <laughs> I I don't know I need to think about this a little bit more it's not exactly crystallizing to me but I mean just sort of this idea that like yeah you if you develop a political group that's so dominant it, it just completely takes over you know the the politics of a country, and it's very difficult to create an insurgent group because of various regulatory moats. Yeah, maybe maybe that's what happened. Like, okay, so suppose that you know you could view maybe in the United States the 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 Republicans and Democrats of the late twentieth century as being not exactly two sides of the same coin, but there, there was a lot of there, there was a lot of locking out of alternative parties in the late late 20th century and and maybe what we're seeing now is sort of an attempt to maintain that sort of at least strangle hold on politics using some new methods because like you know what was happening before wasn't working so maybe now you do something like you know something like this successor ideology where the point is to keep the same people in power but you just have a new justification now that is maybe more effective than you know the old default whatever is working before. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it, it, I think it used to be pretty much an, an oligarchy uh, and now it's moving into monopoly territory and it's ha probably been sliding mm. into monopoly territory slowly. And the way it's been able to maintain its monopoly is by, you know, the, the public private partnership, because it, it, there's no mistaking it. Like corporations at the moment are, you know, are part of, this, you know, this egregore of, of, I don't know, woke capital or whatever, there is an, there's a tacit or maybe more explicit understanding that, you know, um, they will not be destroyed by this beast that they're cultivating, but, you know, they're actually going to grow with it because um, this is, this is not a, you know, this is not a pro working class movement. It's not a pro, you know, small business movement. It's a pro corporatist movement through all sorts of you know, ideas and like I said, you know, all sorts of ways to, to block other people out by regulation. Uh, it's very globalist. That's where they're making their money, obviously, by offshoring a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's the incentives are very much aligned. And I think that was a stroke of genius, you know, pre pretend to be uh, to be anti-capitalist, but, you know, grow this this these behemoths around you to create almost like a protection racket from from tech and, and, and big corporations. It's yeah, it's genius. I mean, how, you have to hand it to them. That's that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, it does seem to me like, you know, at least whatever the Republican Party is doing right now, it's it's a joke compared to to the, the many tentacled Democratic Party. Yeah, I mean, I wonder. 
I wonder how much of it is actually the Democratic Party proper, which to me feels still kind of, I mean, like charmingly incompetent in a lot of ways. Like, you, you know, I, the, I think the idea of an egregore is that it's, you know, it's this independent entity that's just operating in the, with, with lots of different humans as a substrate running in parallel. And I mean, I, you know, does Biden believe any of this stuff? I'm not sure that he does. I'm not even sure that he knows what it is or even what the kids are talking about these days, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, the dude is what, like in his seventies? Like, come on, <laughs> this, yeah. Is, yeah. this has to be completely incoherent to him and 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 probably a lot of the other leaders, leaders of the Democratic Party too. And it's, I mean, I, I think it's just bigger than that. It's this multi, like multifarious thing that's sweeping up a lot of people even who who don't even entirely understand it. Yeah, I I, com I completely agree. I, I don't I don't want to want it to sound like I think you know there's some some cabal. Um, I, I I do believe that you know kind of I think the Democratic Party is probably you know much more aligned with with this power structure. Um, yeah. And to me, it just feels like it's 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 emergent. It's emergent from you know everything from like you know the civil rights movement the culture of the 1960s you know the the adoration that america has and we all have to have for the culture of the 1960s and yeah. all these little emergent cultural things uh, and incentives for people and corporations and everyone to point into this direction and it doesn't have to be like oh you have to do this but it's like if if the incentives are aligned this is yeah it's like you know trying to move a river off course this is where the river is going you know um, yeah yeah man you mentioned that i i just want to put in one one little um what one little elegy one little um you know one, one eulogy for the old left i mean like the left in the 90s was so charming you know it was it, i think it was this old like revival cult of just just adoring the 1960s and you know like everyone on the left was weird and they i think they actually enjoyed sex and they had all of these different like bizarre causes that they were espousing and everybody was clearly nuts and it was a complete shambles but like i don't know they seemed like they were having a lot more fun maybe i'm not i'm not entirely sure this is true i'm just remembering what my old impression of the left was like the there was there was some psychosis, but it definitely hadn't been corporatized, and it was kind of genuine in in the sentiments that people were feeling, rather than what's happening now, which feels a little bit soulless to me and and well kitschy. Yeah, it's like the the tech layer on top of all of this. It's like the the nineteen sixties on speed, you know, yeah. transhumanist characteristics and like... <laughs> which, yeah. I don't know if this is good, guys. <laughs> it doesn't look yeah. like, like a, a love-in anymore. Um, yeah, very, <laughs> very weird. Yeah. Oh, man. So, I don't know. It's, I'm not exactly throwing my hands up, but, you know, in, in terms of, like, my own life, I'm trying to establish as much independence as I can and, and make sure that I can, you know, really flex on lo sort of, limited atomization to you know build up something else for you know my friends and my family and and whatever else because you know we're we're a small group of people and we're not that powerful and so you know what kind of a life can we live inside of a system like this and i, I think i think there still exist a lot of reasonably good options for having a good life but i mean i you know i guess i've never lived under say some kind of a, a rule as total as that that existed in eastern europe so yeah it's yeah to, to be honest you know we're, we're kind of in the phase of it's, it's called transition and i think we're never gonna <laughs> gonna come out of it um you know there there, there were there were good things in a way tied to that that weren't that had nothing to do necessarily with the politics but it was you know it was more of a you know an ancestral you know family oriented type of living because you were dependent on your family so you kind of had all those good vibes that came off of community and dependence um in a way on each other and you know like we said the negotiating assholes all the time and you had a lot of social skills that maybe people have lost now um yeah yeah it's um it, there's always there's always trade-offs you know you're an economist you know how it is yeah 
yeah we'll see but i think i think you're right i think that's that's the white pill and i think that's the one i subscribe to as well and it's interesting when i when i talk to people uh you know across the um kind of political spectrum across these you know internet venn diagrams that we're in uh you know people on more of the far right people on you know kind of the the left they all kind of have the same prescription for what's going on it's like okay trying to kind of exit make make it comfortable for me and the people around me and you know even if even if their politics don't necessarily uh you know dictate localism it feels like you know that's kind of what people are doing they're trying to live a, a more embodied more local more community focused existence and you know even if it's hard i think it's probably it's probably a good a good move yeah so uh. Yeah. <laughs> but it's 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 yeah i i commend you um before i let you go i want to ask you uh the question of the show and the question right. of the show is um do you have a subversive thinker um could be a writer it could be whatever musician filmmaker um that you think is kind of underrated people have not heard about him or her and um you know would need a little bit of uh, extra limelight um let's see here um I think, yeah, I'm just, I'm actually going to say Peter Abelard. You know, I mentioned him earlier. He was the guy who wrote Sick at Non, um, also famous for his, uh, his, his torrid love affair with his pupil, Heloise, who became a, a, a famous scholar in her own right. Um, Peter Abelard had a, a really interesting life. He, he was this, real hotshot theologian, you know, back, back when universities were still primarily church affairs. And, and, um, so he, I mean, he, he rapidly gained fame. He would do things like go and he, he would just wander from classroom to classroom and interrupt other, other, uh, other people's lectures and like drop arguments and, and try and confound them and then wander on to the next classroom. And, you know, every, everybody loved him. He was adored. He was widely, widely, looked up to as a, as a teacher, even though people also hated him because it was, he was a egomaniacal in this way. Um, and then he felt, he, he started tutoring this, this girl, Heloise, who was, you know, a teenager at this point. And she was the daughter of, I think a fairly powerful merchant in some Italian city. And he of course ended up sleeping with her and they 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 fell very much in love she was she was a genius too and her dad eventually found out about it and he was mad and he hired some thugs who ended up going and castrating abelard and um so he was he was pretty upset about that <laughs> but he 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 ended up going and living in um you know he he retired to a monastery and he and Heloise had a series of letters that they they sent back and forth, and and their um, the, their epistles are are great reading, possibly fabricated, but very much worth reading. So, yeah, Peter nice. Abelard, sick at non. Nice. I I was familiar with the with the kind of the the love story. Uh, I forgot about the castration. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that's an important detail. Uh, yeah, it makes it makes it gives it gives it a bit of punch. Um, I um, yeah. Where where can people find your work? Is there a place you want to point people to towards? My Twitter feed. Honest honestly, you know, I, I have eigenrobot.substack.com, but I think my my real work is done on Twitter and you know, I've, I've got my podcast too, which is a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's, you know, partly an effort to have some kind of a, just focus on people in, in the community who are doing things that they're passionate about, or, you know, even people who are just interesting, who, who don't get as much, you know, airtime on Twitter, but, but who are interesting people and fun to just, just chat with for hours on end. Um, but mostly I can robot at, at Twitter. Cool. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's very much in line with the with the purpose of this podcast. So I'm I'm really happy you came on. Uh, this was so much fun, and yeah, I'll um, I'll see you on Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.